the sin and judgment of spiritual barrenness. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. This prophecy contains a vision of the glorious holy gospel state of the church under the representation of a most glorious temple incomparably excelling that built of old by Solomon, an exposition whereof we have in Second Corinthians 3, 6-8, and so on. The beginning of this chapter sets out the way and means of the calling and gathering of gospel churches, whose worship is to be so glorious, and this is under a vision of waters issuing out of the sanctuary to heal and quicken all places to which they come. By the waters here mentioned is the preaching of the gospel intended, and we may observe of them first their rise, which was from the sanctuary, secondly their progress, they increased until they became a river that none could pass over, thirdly their effects or efficacy, they healed all waters where they came and quickened or caused to live. The fishes that were in them. I must not long insist on these particulars. First, the house or temple from whence these waters issue may be taken two ways. Number one, mystically, to denote only the presence of God. God dwelt in his temple. Thence come these waters from his presence. He sends out the word of the gospel for the conversion and healing of the nation. Psalm 110, 2. Or, number two, figuratively, and that either for the place where the temple of old stood, that is, Jerusalem, as a preaching of the gospel was to go forth from Jerusalem, and the sound of it from thence to proceed unto all the world, as Isaiah 41, 27 and 52, 7, Acts 1, 4 and 8, or for the church of Christ and his apostles, the first glorious spiritual temple unto God whence these waters issued. Secondly, their progress, which is described by degrees, it being at first small, few men preaching it, and to a few, but afterwards increasing until it filled the whole earth. Thirdly, the effects mentioned are ascribed unto these waters or two, quickening and healing, which I shall not in general speak further to, because I shall do it in the opening of my text. In the words of the text, you have the state and condition of those places where the waters of the sanctuary do come, and the effects before ascribed unto them, and are not produced. For so the words are to be read, they shall not be healed. We have here a description of some lands or places whereunto the holy waters do come. First, they are miry and marshy places. Secondly, the events of the waters come unto them, they are not healed. Thirdly, the consequent of that event, they are given unto salt. I shall in a few words lay open the allegory or parable unto you. First, by the waters of the sanctuary I told you is meant the preaching of the gospel, that quickening and healing word which the Lord sends out to gather his church unto himself all the world over, to call his saints to that glorious gospel spiritual worship, which is here described in this vision of a temple. Secondly, the miry, marshy places where these waters come, are such where persons cleave inseparably and incurably to their lusts and sins, so that they are not healed by the word. The healing word of the gospel comes, but they don't receive it. The waters flow over them, they don't drink it in. They are not quickened nor healed by it. Thirdly, to be given unto salt is to be left unto barrenness. Deuteronomy 29.23 Judges 9.45 Jeremiah 17.6 the figurative sense of the passage thus explained will afford us the following observations. Number one, God is pleased oftentimes to send the waters of the sanctuary to miry and marshy places that shall never be healed by them nor made fruitful. Or God in his infinite wisdom is pleased to send the preaching of the word unto some places in which it shall not put forth its quickening and sanctifying power and virtue upon the souls of them that hear it. All places in the world are barren, and sound and unhealthy, before the coming of the waters of the sanctuary upon them, or the souls of all men are spiritually dead and full of woeful distempers until they are quickened and healed by the dispensation of the gospel. The word must come and heal them. Number three, the waters of the sanctuary are healing waters, or the word of the gospel is in its own nature a quickening, healing, sanctifying, saving word to them who receive it. Number four, where the waters of the sanctuary come, and the land is not healed, that land is given up of the Lord to salt or barrenness forever. 
or where the word of the gospel is, by the infinitely wise disposal of God, preached unto a place or persons, and they receive it not so as to have their sinful distempers healed by it, they are usually, after a season, given up by the righteous judgment of God unto barrenness and everlasting ruin. It is this last proposition, is that which is the direct design and scope of the place, that I intend to insist principally upon, but yet I shall speak somewhat to the former. Number 1. God is pleased sometimes, in his infinite wisdom, to send the preaching of the word unto some places in which it shall not put forth its quickening and sanctifying power and virtue upon the souls of them that hear it. The whole scripture and whole story of the providence of God in sending the gospel abroad in the world bears witness to this truth. It was his way from the foundation of the world and continues to this very day. Hence was that complaint of the prophet Isaiah 53, 1, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The gospel is preached to them that believe, not the report thereof. And Isaiah 49, 4, Then I said, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for naught. But we need no greater instance, nor any other than that of our Savior, who spent the greatest part of his ministry in preaching to them, who were never healed, never converted, nor sanctified by his word. That account he gives of his work, Matthew eleven twenty one to 24 Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! Now, though there be no searching into the depths of the counsels of God, yet there appear many reasons in which his wisdom in this dispensation shines forth. As first, he does it principally because in those places where the word is rejected by the generality of the people, yet there may be some secret, poor souls belonging to the election of grace, whom God will have gathered and called home to himself. So for their sakes... Though in the world they are taken no notice of, the word shall be preached unto multitudes. Amos 9, verse 9. I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted. In a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. The grains of Israel must be preserved through all the nations of the earth, that not one grain may be lost. Thus Paul preaches the gospel at Philippi, Acts 16, 12, and 13. And what entertainment does it meet with? He and his companions are taken and beaten and cast into prison, sore hurt and wounded. Verses 22 and 23. Why then was it that the gospel must be preached there? Why, there was a stranger come to that town, a poor woman, one Lydia, that dwelt at Thyatira, and she was to be converted and brought home to God. Verse 14. So at Athens in chapter 17, verse 34. And the apostle affirms that he endured all things for the elect's sakes. Second Timothy 2, verse 10. Here and there a poor despised person is designed to be called. But secondly, God does it for a testimony against them that receive it not, and to leave them inexcusable at the last day. Mark 6, verse 11. Whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. The word is to be preached, and witness, as it were, is to be taken upon it that it was preached, that men may be left without excuse at the last day. As our Savior pleads concerning his own preaching to the Pharisees, John 15, verse 22, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. God will cause men to be without excuse by that tender of mercy which is made unto them in the gospel. It shall be for a testimony against them at the last day. Application. Let not men boast themselves in the outward enjoyment of the word, nor rest themselves in it. It were well indeed if all were believers to whom the word is preached. If all lands were healed, where the waters of the sanctuary come. But the Holy Ghost tells us they are not so. Hebrews 4 verse 2. The word preached did not profit them. Capernaum was exalted unto heaven in the use of means, but brought down to hell for the neglect of them. Let men look to themselves. God has various ends in sending the gospel. The Lord knows what will be the end of England's enjoying the gospel so long as it has done. 
Sad symptoms appear of a tremendous issue, but I shall speak of this afterward. Part 2. The souls of all men are spiritually dead and full of woeful distempers, until they are quickened and healed by the dispensation of the gospel. The waters of the sanctuary must come to quicken them and heal them. They are distempered, therefore, and woefully disordered before the coming of these waters. So the apostle informs us, Titus 3, verse 5, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Before the gospel, grace comes to heal and cleanse them. This is the state and condition of men, as it is more largely described by the Apostle in Romans 1.18 to the end. I shall not stay to mention all the particular distempers that rage in some, and that rule and reign in all before the coming of the gospel, as darkness, blindness, ignorance, worldly-mindedness, sensuality, hatred of God, envy, and malice, which are fixed in the souls of men by presumption and self-righteousness. There is nothing in them of spiritual life or holiness, of purity or zeal, nothing that is acceptable or pleasing unto God. But to set forth this to the utmost were to describe the whole natural condition of men, which is not my present work, and therefore I shall not further insist on it. The word of the gospel is, in its own nature, a quickening, healing, sanctifying, saving word to them who receive it. They, the waters of the sanctuary, bring Christ along with them, the great physician of souls who alone is able to cure a sin-sick soul. They bring mercy with them to pardon sinners, that the inhabitants of the land may no more say they are sick, having their sins forgiven them. Isaiah 33, verse 24. They bring grace with them to cure all the distempers of lusts. Isaiah 11, 5-7. Titus 2, verse 11 and 12. The things I have only touched upon and proceed now to the fourth observation on which I chiefly propose to insist. Number 4. Where the waters of the sanctuary come, and the land is not healed, that land is given up of the Lord to salt and barrenness forever. Or where the word of the gospel is preached unto a place or person, since they receive it not so as to have their sinful distempers healed by it, they are given up by the righteous judgment of God unto barrenness and everlasting ruin. To clear this proposition, I shall show, number one, what I mean by the coming of the waters of the sanctuary, or the preaching of the gospel to a place or persons. Number two, what by healing their sinful distempers. Number three, what by being given up to barrenness and ruin. Number one, by the coming of the healing waters of the sanctuary, I intend not the occasional preaching of a sermon, although this be sufficient to justify God in the rejection of any person or people. In the first preaching of the gospel, the refusal of one sermon lost many their souls unto all eternity. When the Lord Jesus sent out his disciples to preach the tidings of everlasting peace, he commanded them to pass through the towns, cities, and villages, and to offer them peace and mercy in the word of truth, which if they received not, they were to shake off the dust of their feet against them. Matthew ten twelve to 15 Luke 10, 8-12 but O oh, the unspeakable patience of Christ to many in the world, where the word is continued oft times for a very long season, and the salvation tendered therein despised. But this is that which I intend as the rule of the dispensation mentioned, namely when God by his providence doth cause a word to be preached for some continuance, and to the revelation of his whole counsel, as Paul affirmed himself to have done at Ephesus, Acts 20, verse 27, where he had abode above a year. Nor do I mean any waters, but the waters of the sanctuary, not any preaching, but the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which Paul affirms to be his work. Ephesians 3, verse 8. All waters are not the waters of the sanctuary. All preaching is not the preaching of the sanctuary. There is preaching in the world wherein God and the souls of men are no more concerned than in an oration of an ancient heathen. Many undertake to be preachers who never stood in the counsel of God, as he complains, Jeremiah 23, verse 22, who never received of the Spirit of Christ, nor knew his mind. Blind leaders of the blind, 
The children of Zion are promised under the gospel that they shall be all taught of God. And we have men undertaken to be teachers of them who never learned anything of Christ, a wicked generation of soul murderers for which cursed work they every day invent new engines, whom the Lord's soul abhors. See their condition and portion, Ezekiel 34, 3 and 4, and so on. I mean, therefore, a dispensation of the word according to the mind of Christ, the due unfolding of the mystery of the gospel. This is the coming I intend. Number 2. What is meant by their sinful distempers not being healed? Look what the waters of the sanctuary come to do. If they be not effected, they are not healed. Now there are two effects here ascribed unto the waters of the sanctuary. Number one, they quicken and give new life. Verse nine, a natural life they had before, but these give them another life. Number two, healing is the waters of Jericho by Elisha, Second Kings 2, verse 21. Where these effects are not produced, that is the condition described. That is the state of these miry and marshy places. They are not healed. First, men are not quickened. They receive not a new spiritual life. They are not so brought to the knowledge of God. It is not enough that men have their affections wrought upon or their lives in some measures reformed. Unless they are quickened, unless they receive a new spiritual life by the word, they are as the unhealed places over which the curse here mentioned hangs. Number two. The healing of these quickened souls consists in the curing and mortifying of their sinful distempers. This follows the other. Where there is life, there will be healing. Let not men pretend that they live spiritually if their lusts be not healed. If men are proud, worldly, sensual, they are dead also. There is no effect of the waters of the sanctuary upon them. If men are not made holy, humble, believing, zealous, if they receive not the spirit of prayer and faith, they are not healed. This is a condition of the miry and marshy places here mentioned. God in his infinite wisdom and goodness causes the gospel to be dispensed among a people, to be preached, where they do or may and ought to attend unto it, but they are not converted by the word, not sanctified by it, but continue in their old state and condition. He that was filthy is filthy still. He that was unrighteous is so still. He that was in the mire of the world and sin is so still. Number three. What is the lot and portion of such persons? Why, they shall be given to salt. That is, as I have showed, to barrenness, fruitlessness, unprofitableness, and eternal ruin. This is the meaning of the proposition. And it is a dreadful word which yet is true and will prove so at the last day. Woe to the miry and marshy places of the world. Woe to the persons and places to whom and to which the waters of the sanctuary have come and they are not healed. I shall not need to insist much on the proof of the proposition. The scripture so abounds with testimonies of it. But I shall do these three things. First, Name some places that plainly speak the same truth. Number two, show the degree in which God proceeds usually in this great work and given up unprofitable hearers to ruin. And number three, give the grounds of it. Number one, for other scriptures which assert the same truth, take Proverbs 1, verses 25 to 31. But you have said it not all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Proverbs 29, verse 1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Luke 13, verse 6. He spake also this parable. 
A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none, and so on. So Hebrews ten, twenty eight to thirty, Second Corinthians two, fifteen and sixteen. Number two. For the degrees of rejection, see Ezekiel ten eighteen and eleven twenty three and Hebrews six eight. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh into cursing, whose end is to be burned. They are first rejected, then cursed, and lastly burned. But number three, that which I shall principally insist upon is to show the ways in which God doth usually proceed in giving up such persons to barrenness, and so to everlasting ruin. Number one, he casts them out of his care. He will be at no more charge nor cost with them nor about them. So Hebrews 6 verse 8. The land is rejected. The owner will take no more care or pains about such an unprofitable piece of land. He will till it no more, dress it no more, but leave it to its own barrenness. God is a great husbandman, John 15 verse 1. When a miry place is not healed, he will cast it out of his husbandry. So Ezekiel 24, verse 13. They have had their time and season and are not purged. Therefore they shall be purged no more. Jeremiah six twenty nine and 30. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. This the Lord Christ declares to be his way of proceeding with them, Zechariah 11, verses 8 and 9. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then I said, I will not feed you. That that dieth, let it die. That that is to be cut off, let it be cut off, and let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. A sad parting the Lord knows. They give up Christ, he gives up them and their meeting will be infinitely more sad to them. Now this the Lord does several ways. First, he will sometimes utterly remove the gospel from them, turn the streams of the water of the sanctuary, that they shall come to them no more. So he threatened the church at Ephesus of old, Revelation 2, verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and so on, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place. They shall have the light of the word, no more. It shall be removed and taken from them. Ah, how many places lie under this woeful judgment of God at this day, this sentence of being given up to salt forever. Places there are in the world that have enjoyed the word at God's appointed season, or at least the tender of it, an opportunity to enjoy it, but continuing unprofitable under it, what is now their state and condition. God has left them to that sore judgment that they themselves should be made instrumental to cast out the word from amongst them, like the foolish woman pulling down the house with their own hands. And so they have got darkness for a vision, and they that would not rejoice in the truth and in the light do now, through the tremendous judgment of God, triumph in darkness and in a thing of naught. It is true the gospel may be sometimes taken for a season from a people for their trial and exercise, and not penalty. It may be driven from them, and not absolutely sinned away. Now as the Lord has many glorious ends in such a dispensation, so it may easily be known whether people have lost the gospel only for a season, in a way of trial or penalty, as the beginning of their being given up to salt and barrenness is first, they that are deprived for a season of gospel enjoyments for their trial and exercise are sensible of the displeasure of God in that dispensation, and greatly humble themselves under his hand on that account. They say, as a church, in Micah 7, verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord, because I have sinned against him, until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. They look on this as the greatest calamity and trial that can befall them, whereas they that lose its penalty are either little concerned about it or do greatly rejoice at it. The word tormented them, and they are glad they are freed from it. Revelation 11, verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Some never rejoice more than when they are got 
quit of the gospel, and others are like Galileo. Now when such as these have the word taken from them, and are no way sensible of the displeasure of the Lord in it, nor do humble themselves before him on that account, it is a certain evidence that God has given them up unto a state of salt, that is, barrenness and eternal ruin. Secondly, they that are deprived of it for a season in a way of trial have no rest, but are earnest with the Lord for the return of it. 1 Samuel 7 verse 2 The ark was gone, and though they had peace and plenty and all things else in abundance, yet all will not satisfy them. The ark is absent, that pledge of God's presence, and they lamented after him. So it is with these. Let them have peace or liberty or prosperity. All is one if they have not the ark. If they have not the gospel and ordinances of God, they can take no rest, but are still lamenting after the Lord, still longing after the enjoyment of his word. David does excellently express this frame of heart. Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. He was driven from the ordinances of God. The waters of the sanctuary did not come to him. On the other hand, those from whom the word is taken away penally are no way troubled about it, nor do long after it. They rejoice in what they have in the room of it, are exceedingly well pleased without it. Let them have an increase of corn and wine and oil. Let them have their lusts and their sports, their formalities and follies. They don't care whether ever they hear the word of the gospel any more. Such men are certainly entering into a condition of salt or barrenness and ruin. Thirdly, they who are deprived of the word for a season for their trial have a high estimation and value of their mercy and privilege who enjoy it. They do not think the proud happy, nor envy it prosperous wickedness, nor bow in their hearts before the Hamans of the earth, but those they think blessed to enjoy the word and the presence of God therein. This our Savior teaches them to esteem, Luke 11:28. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. David does excellently set out this frame of heart in Psalm 84, verse 4. Blessed are they that dwell in your house. They will be still praising you. Selah. I am, he says, a poor outcast, deprived of your word and ordinances. Oh, the blessed condition of those who enjoy them. Let them be what they will, as to their outward state. They are in a blessed condition if they may dwell in your house. Enjoy the privileges of the spiritual house of God and his worship in the gospel. This is a frame of such persons. Those only they esteem blessed who are refreshed with the waters of the sanctuary. But none are more despised by those from whom the gospel is judicially removed. It is the great, the mighty, the rich, the sensual that they esteem blessed. For those others they esteem as the dirt or the mire. Now hence it is that God may at the same time remove his gospel from a place, judicially from some, and by a way of trial from others, in which these contrary effects are produced. Some are humbled under the hand of the Lord, mourn after his presence, and account them blessed who enjoy his ordinances. Others triumph and rejoice in their condition, look upon it as good and blessed, at least are little concerned in the dispensation that God is dealing with them in. And as the Lord does good to the former by this exercise, preparing them also for further mercies and a greater estimation of his word, and profiting under it when enjoyed, so to the other this is the entrance of their ruin. They are cast out of the care of God, and ye never see such a people afterward obtain mercy. Number two, God does this sometimes though he causes the word to be continued to them, by restraining the efficacy of it, that it shall not profit them. Men may have lived out their season that God has given them to be healed in, and yet God have work to do in that place where they live, so that the word must be preached. Some poor souls amongst them are to be quickened or healed, called or edified, so that he will not turn away the course of these holy waters, but continue the dispensation of the gospel. But as for those who have withstood their season of healing and are cast out of the care of God, God will have so 
order things, that the word shall have no power upon them. Now, though the righteous judgment of God have a hand in this manner, yet by his permission their own lusts are the immediate cause of it, as, first, they shall have some prejudices against them by whom the gospel is dispensed and the power and purity of it, which shall keep them from attending unto or profiting by their message. So in the days of Ahab there were four hundred preachers that he had a mind to hear, but they were all false prophets, teachers of lies, idolatrous and superstitious. Only there were two prophets of the Lord, Elijah the Tishbite and Micaiah the son of Imlah. And both these he looked upon as his enemies, as persons not well affected unto him, so that he would believe nothing of what they preached. So of Elijah, 1 Kings 21, verse 20, and of Micaiah, chapter 22, verse 8, so shall it befall many whom God will leave to salt, because the season of their healing hath been withstood. Though the word be preached, they shall have prejudices against the dispensers of it, so that they shall not profit by them. And little do they think that these prejudices and hard thoughts are chains and fetters to keep them unto the judgment of the great day. And of this nature also are other prejudices that men have. Secondly, he will allow them to be unconquerably hardened in the love of some sin or lust, which shall keep off the power of the word from their hearts. So the ground here that is not healed is said to be miry and marshy, such as has a mixture of filth incorporated with it sufficient to repel all the virtue of the healing waters of the sanctuary. Thus we see men every day so furiously set upon their lusts, sports, and sensuality that they hate and are filled with madness and rage against all that would persuade them to sobriety. Much more does the word of the gospel torment them, so that they rise with fury against us, and it keeps them from profiting by it. They are given to salt. Thirdly, God withdraws the efficacy of his spirit in a dispensation of the word, that it shall not have that strength and power on them as upon others. God sends his word towards his own way in a covenant, and then it is always accompanied with the Spirit, Isaiah fifty nine twenty one. And where God deals with men in covenant mercy, these go together. But now when he casts men out of his care, though the word may be preached to their ear, because of some others whom he yet cares for, yet he has said concerning them that his Spirit shall strive with them no more. And since it is that the word makes no impression on them, its healing virtue is as to them withheld. And this is the first thing the Lord does to such poor creatures as he leaves to salt, to barrenness and ruin. For despising the season and means of their healing, he casts them out of his care as to the dispensation of the word. We shall now proceed to the applications. Use 1. Wonder not if you see a diversity of success in preaching of the word. Some receive it with joy, the most despise it as a thing of naught. Whence is this difference? Multitudes are rejected of God, cast out of his care, barren land. He will till them no more. A cursed state. Marvel not that many refuse to hear the word that they love lies. They are given up of God to their hearts, lusts. Marvel not that the word which they hear affects them no more. The power of the Spirit is withheld from them. Multitudes are thus cast out of the care of God, and tokens of the plague are upon them. They like their condition, rejoice and triumph in it, think none so happy as themselves, and despise them that love the waters of the sanctuary, all which are tokens of the sore plague. Can they expel the gospel from any place? Can they quench the light that is in it? Can they triumph over the ways of God? They suppose they have gotten a great victory. This is not an ordinary judgment. They are poor creatures, assuredly cast out of the care of God. They are given to salt, and it is a miracle of mercy if ever any of them be healed. Oh, it is a woeful thing to look on a place or persons that give evidences of their withstanding the season of their healing, as so many in this nation do. How is our Savior affected with it in reference to Jerusalem? Luke nineteen forty one and 42. And when he was come near, he beheld a city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. 
Oh, if we had but any measure of that pity and compassion which dwelt in his holy soul, how could we pass through towns and cities and see and hear and not mourn? Use number two. Take that advice of the prophet Jeremiah thirteen sixteen. Give glory to the Lord your God before he cause darkness, and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death, and make it gross darkness. Number two, the second thing that God doth in giving up an unhealed land and a barrenness is his judicial hardening of them or leaving them to hardness and impenitency, that so they may fill up the measures of their sins. Hebrews 6, 8. That which bear thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing. When the care of God is once taken from them, they are nigh unto cursing. The next thing that God will do to them is to curse them, as our Savior did the barren fig tree. This woeful judgment is at large set forth, Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Isaiah was a gospel preacher. Yet this, saith God, shall be the effect of thy preaching towards them that have withstood their season, and have not been healed by the word. And John tells us that this very thing was accomplished when the gospel was preached by our Savior himself. John twelve forty and 41. And surely their condition is most woeful, whom the preaching of the gospel hardens, whom the only remedy destroys. Now there are four things in the spiritual judgment that God sends upon unhealed souls that have outlived their season of healing more or less. Number one, blindness of mind and understanding. Their natural blindness and ignorance shall be increased and confirmed and that by two ways. First, God will send them a spirit of slumber. Romans 11 verse 8, that is a great inadvertency and negligence as to the things of the gospel that are spoken of or preached unto them. As men that slumber take little notice of what is spoken to them or about them, they hear a noise and sometimes discern a little what is spoken, but not to any use or purpose, so is it with these persons on whom God does judicially send the spirit of slumber. They hear the sound of the word, and sometimes it may be, take notice of some one thing or other that is spoken, but to receive and understand the design of it, to ponder it and improve it, that they cannot do. They are under a spiritual slumber. We may see multitudes in this condition every day. The word has no life nor vigor towards them. They don't perceive the mind of God in it. They don't understand it. God has given them a spirit of slumber, and they die under it. Secondly, God sends them a spirit of giddiness, causing them to err in their ways. Isaiah 19, verse 14. We have a notable instance of this judgment of God. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 10 to 12. The waters of the sanctuary came unto them, and they were not healed. The gospel was preached unto them, but they withstood their season. They received not the love of the truth. They did not believe and obey that they might be saved, because they had pleasure in unrighteousness. How then does God deal with them? Verse 11. He will send them a spirit of giddiness or delusion that they shall believe a lie, false doctrine, false worship, superstition, and idolatry. This they shall believe and have pleasure in, which will have the fearful end mentioned. Verse 12. And this judgment, as it already has come upon many, so it lies at the door, I fear, of the most. We see men every day that have for some years, it may be, enjoyed the preaching of the gospel, but not being healed, quickened, and sanctified by it, are now with all greediness given up to follow after fables on the one hand, or superstition on the other. There is a spirit of giddiness from the Lord upon them, and by these means is the darkness of the minds of men increase when God is given of them up to barrenness. Number two, obstinacy in the will or hardness of heart properly so called is in this judgment of God also. God will give up unhealed persons to hardness of heart. So is it in that place of Isaiah 6.10. And it is the same with that which the apostle calls a reprobate mind, Romans 1.28. That is a mind and heart that is good for nothing with regard to spiritual things, 
profligate and altogether insensible of them. And when this befalls any, they will openly despise the word and cast it off, using one foolish pretense or other for their so doing, as Jeremiah 44, verse 16, and 43, verse 2. Such persons, whenever the word is preached unto them, and it lies crossed to their carnal imaginations or sensual affections, lusts, or sports, rise up in their hearts with contempt and rage against it. Sometimes they will color with their wickedness in their hearts by some pretense or other. This is the way, the humor, the singularity of the preacher. Or sometimes their rage will carry them directly out against a word without any color or pretense, but because it displeases them. Or if they fall not thus into pride and rage, which usually is occasioned by their temptations, they grow utterly senseless and stupid and unconcerned in the things of God. Let the word thunder from heaven against their sins, they don't regard it. Let the still small voice of the gospel persuade them unto reconciliation, they don't attend to it. Let the judgments of God be abroad in the world, if they escape themselves, they are not concerned about them. Do they reach their own persons, if they have wrath and anger and vexation, but they cannot repent or turn to the Lord? This is apparently the condition of most in the world. Number 3. Sensuality of affections is in this judgment also. Romans one twenty six. He gave them up to vile affections, that is, to place their affections on vile sensual things. Unhealed persons shall do so. Our streets, alehouses, and many other places are full of such whose affections are fixed with madness on vile things, and they please themselves in them, little thinking that this is part of the judgment whereunto they are given up of God for their unprofitableness, under the word, for they're not being healed by the waters of the sanctuary. Number four, searedness of conscience, First Timothy 4, verse 2, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, Ephesians 4, 19, being past feeling, whatever sin they commit or condition they fall into, conscience shall no more discharge its duty in them and towards them. And this is the second thing that God will do towards such unhealed persons. Number three, the third thing considerable is the event of this dealing of God with them, or what is meant by this land's becoming salt. Two things, as I have showed before, are hereby intended. One, barrenness in this world, and two, eternal ruin in the world to come. Number one, barrenness. They shall never bear any fruit to God. This is a curse that our Savior gave to the fig tree. Never fruit grow on thee. Man was made to bear fruit unto God. This is all he came into the world for. Now when God shall say to any, Go your ways, you shall never do anything more for me while you live in this world. You shall never bear any fruit to me. What sore judgment can any man possibly fall under? I might show you the misery of this condition in many particulars. Israel is an empty vine. Hosea 10 verse 1. Number 2. Eternal ruin and that irreparable. Proverbs 29 verse 1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. John 15, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast him into the fire, and they are burned. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 12. That they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hebrews 6, verse 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. This is a certain event of that land that is left unto salt, because not healed. And of those persons who, having passed over their seasons of quickening and sanctifying by the word, are given up to barrenness and ruin, it will do neither me nor you good to flatter you, and to put you into any better hope than your condition will admit of. Ezekiel 33, verse 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. This will be the end of the one and the other when that course is taken. Did I not see the tokens of this judgment of God abroad in the world? I would not thus insist upon it as I do. Use one of exhortation. Make use of your season. You fall not under the sore and inexpressible judgment. God gives men a season, a space to repent in. Revelation 2.21 This space and season, as I have showed you before, is not oft times all the while that the gospel is preached unto you. 
the word may be preached, and yet its efficacy wholly restrained from you, and that because your time and season is gone, and so it comes to pass daily, and you don't know how soon it may be your lot and portion, and you don't perceive it. Therefore is the apostle so earnest in exhorting men to make use of their day before their season be gone. Hebrew 3, 12 and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. As if he should say, take heed to yourselves, stir up yourselves, for if your day be once passed over, you are then gone forever. It will then be too late for you to look after mercy. And so again in Second Corinthians 6 verse 2, now is the day, now is the time. If you stand in need of any commodity that can be had but at one fair, that day, that season you will not neglect. You stand in need, I am sure, of grace, mercy, pardon, Christ, life, salvation. There is only this day, this season, for you to obtain it in. Oh, that you would be persuaded to look out after it, before it be hidden from you. Hebrews 10, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So the same apostle again in Hebrews 12, verse 15 looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Use all diligence in this manner. To excite you a little to this, consider first that if you are not healed during your season, you can never be healed. If the gospel doesn't cure you, you must die in your sins. Men are greatly mistaken when they flatter themselves that it can never be too late for them in this world. There is time enough whilst they are alive. Alas, you have but your season, and that may be over with you many days before you leave the world, yea, many years. We have everywhere ground evidently left to salt, though yet not burned up. Use your day. Number two. You don't know how your day is going away, nor when it will be over. The traveler on the road that has a journey to go knows how to order his affairs. It is, he says, so many hours tonight, and I have time enough before me. So does the laboring man also, but alas, it is not so with you. You know not how soon your day may be over. I speak not of your lies, which the Lord knows are uncertain, but the day of the gospel may be over whilst the day of your lives continue. Nor can you be certain of the day of the preaching of the word, but your day and your season in it may come to an end this day or this night for aught that you or I know. So that your concernment is unspeakably great in the proposal that is made unto you. Remember the virgins that were shut out in their cry at midnight. You will say then, what shall we do to know when it is our season that we may apply our hearts unto this exhortation? I answer the Lord alone, who is a searcher of all hearts, knows how it is with you, and whether you have not any of you in particular outstood your opportunity. I can only tell you what is a gospel season, which you are to take care that you may have a share and interest in. Number one, it is required that the gospel be preached in the power and purity of it. This in general makes the acceptable day the time of salvation, and if there be nothing else concurring, this is enough to let a people or person know that the day of the Lord has come upon them, that the waters of the sanctuary are come unto them. Now consider with yourselves whether the gospel be preached unto you or not, or whether you may not or might not have it so preached unto you, or enjoy the dispensation of it. Did you but discharge your duty? If it be so, this is one evidence that it is yet your day. Number two, it is a special season when providential calls do join in with and further gospel calls, when God causes a people to be dispensed unto a people, and at the same time puts forth some acts of his providence that are suited to awaken men to the consideration of their state and condition. Then is the season of that people. I shall not go over the several providential calls that have been upon us to inquire after the ways of God, or all the alterations that have been amongst us, discovering the great uncertainty of all things that are here below. No call? Was there no call in the great unseasonableness of the year? No call in the danger of the loss of the gospel, which seems to stand ready for its flight from you? The great uncertainty how long you may enjoy these waters of the sanctuary? 
It is certain that if you have not neglected already your season, your day of grace, you are now under the time that you are to be tried in. Number three. Then is the season when God moves, as he does at some seasons, more effectually upon your hearts and spirits in the dispensation of the word than at other times. This you alone can give an account of. You only know how it is with you. You can tell whether you have not been moved by the word more than formerly or convinced by it, whether have you not had purposes of amendment and reformation wrought in you by it, whether you have not been caused to love it more than you have formerly done, whether it has not begotten at times resolutions in you to try for life and immortality. If it have not, it is much to be feared, lest the Lord is leaving you to salt, to in a state of perishing and everlasting ruin. But if you have had such effects wrought in you, know of a certain that the kingdom of God hath come unto you. And if you withstand your opportunity, you are gone and undone forever, unless you make thorough work before this dispensation be overpassed. Number four. When you see others about you earnest after the word, this is God's call and ordinance unto you to look to your own condition. If now by any of these means you come to know that the day of the Lord and the season of your healing is upon you, oh, that you would be prevailed with to be wise for your own souls and to close with the word of the gospel before the things of your peace be hidden from your eyes. I thought in the next place to have given you the signs of a departing gospel day and evidences of men's having outlived their season and being given up to salt and barrenness, but for some reasons forbear. Used to, to discover the miserable condition of poor creatures that having not in their season been healed by the waters of the sanctuary, are given up of the Lord to salt and barrenness. No heart can conceive nor tongue express the misery of such poor creatures. Let me only mention some particulars. Number one, they know not that they are so miserable. They don't perceive, they don't understand the sore judgment that they are under. Do but their heads ache or are they sick of an egg? They fill it presently and seek out for remedies, but in this case the curse of God is upon them, and they do not at all perceive it. And so don't seek out for relief, Hosea 7 verse 9. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. They are nigh to ruin, to destruction, and don't perceive it. They take no notice of the misery that is at hand, ready to devour them. Or if in any time they begin so to do, they shift off the thought of it, which is a great part of their misery. Number two, they are pleased with the condition in which they are. They cry peace and safety when sudden destruction is at hand. First Thessalonians 5 or 3. They please themselves in their condition when the vengeance of the Lord is ready to seize upon them. Is the gospel removed from them and the streams of the sanctuary turned away? They are so far from being troubled at it that they rejoice in it, as has been declared. They think they may now follow their lusts freely and do whatever seems good unto themselves. They despise others and bless themselves as if all were well with them. Or is the word yet continued, but they... Left to senselessness and salt under it, they are pleased with their estate. Wonder at those who are troubled under the word and exceedingly despise them. All is well with themselves, and some of them are ready to deride all others that are under the work of the Lord. On this account it is that they do not, will not, look out for relief or healing. Number three, no man can help or relieve them. Men may pity them, but they cannot help them. All the world cannot pull a poor creature out from under the curse of the great God. Number four, their eternal ruin is certain as before proved. And number five, this ruin is very sore on gospel despisers.